Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm your host, Chief Cat Herder, and founder of the forum. And we have a great guest today on a great topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. What we're going to be talking about today is what seems like a very wonk issue, a very technical issue, but it's one that really has crucial importance for all dimensions of higher education. We're talking about metrics, the numbers that we use in order to determine all kinds of things, what classes we should take, what colleges we should go to, how to fund higher education. And what we have today with us is a couple of authors, at least one of them, uh, who have published a new book on metrics that matter. And they take a critical eye on everything from return on investment to U.S. News and World Reports. And they ask us to rethink the metrics we use. If we cite the old American adage that what gets measured gets managed, then we need to change what gets measured so we can change how we organize higher education. Now, to join us, uh, I'm delighted to bring from Yale University, Professor Zachary Bleemer. Uh, Zach is an assistant professor uh, who works in the School of Business and Management, uh, and he is one of the authors of this fascinating new book. Professor Bleemer, welcome. Hey, thanks so much, Brian. Thanks to all of you for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. How are you doing today? And, and where are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, I am in my apartment in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, I'm really excited to be talking about this work with you all. Excellent. Excellent. Well, a key question, and I'll ask it before somebody else does, is do you have any snow? <laughs> I think, as a couple of other people mentioned in the chat, it is unseasonably warm here in New Haven. It's about 70 degrees, so it's, uh, if anything, I should probably go open a window. Wow, 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 wow. That's amazing. Well, uh, if you open a window, just make sure there aren't any loud arrests going on outside. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, yeah, I've only lived in New Haven six months, and I'm learning the town very quickly. That's a big part of it. I bet you are. I bet you are. Well, uh, welcome to, uh, to that position. Uh, Zach, we have a tradition on the forum. We're asking people to introduce themselves by talking about the future, not about their past. And I'm really curious, what are you going to be working on for the next year? Uh, are, what projects, what courses, what writing, what, what topics are going to be top of mind for you? Sure. So, you know, you, you all, I suppose, got somewhat unlucky. Of the five authors who put together this book, Metrics That Matter, I'm the, the, the sort of technical economist, and so you're going to have to deal with me for the next 50 minutes. Oh, no. As the, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's the, it's the luck of the draw. So, uh, so, so I, I'm an economist. I primarily think about the mobility and equity ramifications of higher education policy. So I'm sort of working in three different areas going forward for the next year. The first is uh, working on a couple of projects related to undergraduate admissions policies, race-based affirmative action, and its race-neutral alternatives. Trying to understand how various policies, you know, including recent policies like test optional and test free admissions, change the composition of students and have long run implications for targeted students. Mm. And the second area I'm thinking about is in policies that restrict access to certain college majors even after students have enrolled. Thinking about GPA and other sort of essay or uh, uh, selective restriction policies on depart in departments like engineering and other uh, generally more lucrative fields of study. And I'm thinking about the long run ramifications for students of being excluded from their most preferred fields of study. And then the third is looking at a longitudinal project, building a number of databases of early 20th century higher education in the United States, oh. understanding how higher education has evolved over time, and then how changes in access across institutions and access across uh, uh, college majors have oh. changed kids, uh, uh, basically the, the mobility ramifications of America's higher education sector for lower income students. So you mean uh, socioeconomic mobility or geographic mobility? Uh, socioeconomic mobility. So the degree to which lower income kids go to college, what colleges they go to, what they study in college, and how access to these various programs has shifted over time. Excellent, excellent. That, that all sounds terrific. And the first one may have great timing depending on the Supreme Court's uh, ruling this summer and fall. Yes. Yeah, I started working on affirmative action projects about five years ago, not knowing the political ramifications of the work. Sometimes these things line up. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and maybe we'll circle back and uh, bring you back to talk about that, depending on what happens. Sure, sure. Um, well, yeah, but I, I should emphasize you know, the, the, the sort of the structure of the book that we've put together is really intended to translate a lot of work that I and my colleagues have done in economics and other quantitative fields trying to study the ramifications of different educational choices and now trying to translate that knowledge 
to kids and parents about whether and where to go to college and what to study when they're in school? Well, that, that's actually good, a good way to start. And, and friends, if, if you're new to the forum, by the way, what usually happens is I, I ask our, our poor guest a couple of uh, fumbling questions and they cut loose and show off their brilliance. And then I turn over the mic to all of you. Uh, so one question I did want to ask just to start off with is this is an unusual book. It's a multi, five authors, I think. Um, but but you're you're complete. You're all co-authors. You don't have individual chapters or anything. How how'd that come about? Yeah. So unfortunately, my compatriot, Chris Newfield, couldn't join us today. I, I hope that he would be here to sort of share the stage with me. But Chris was the initial motivator for this project. He organized a group through the University of California Humanities Research Institute in UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, basically, there was like a selective admissions procedure by which people were admitted into a residential research fellowship in the spring of 2018, which gives you a sense of how long it takes to write books. Yeah. Uh, the group of us got together and then uh, talked over how to best think through this issue of the metrics that are used by universities and students to guide uh, resources, uh, and then either what uh, uh, metrics could be alternatively used on the university side or alternatively used on the student side to make better choices. And so the five of us, we span the uh, you know, academic disciplines. Chris Newfield uh, uh, works in the uh, an English department and in critical university studies. There are a number of qualitative social scientists and then uh, uh, two quantitative social scientists, uh, uh, Ashish Mehta, who's also an economist, and myself. And, uh, and so the five of us, I think, came from a number of different disciplinary perspectives and did our best to, in a sense, you know, translate through multiple stages. You know, Ashish and I would go out and find a number of studies and, and then sort of talk them over with the group. The group would also sort of, uh, 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 you know, from a start, bring together as much work as we could, talk it through in these sort of like endless discussions, a fun part of residential research fellowships is we got to spend three months really very much face-to-face -face talking every day about this work. And we ended up with this design where while we each had uh, individual metrics that we were sort of the lead on and trying to explain what the metric was, how it was currently being used, what alternatives were available, and to make some recommendations ultimately for parents and kids about uh, alternative metrics or non-metrics that would help them uh, make better choices. You know, we each took leads, but then we did a lot of rewriting of each other's chapters. It was very much a, a team effort, for which reason we decided not to sort of you know have our names on each individual chapter. Fundamentally, the five of us all wrote all of the chapters in the book. That's a fascinating synthesis, and what a great low-tech, front-loaded process of just being face-to-face. -face and It was tremendously fun, and hopefully we produce something that can be of value to others. We certainly enjoyed uh, producing it. Well, it's definitely a terrific book. Uh, the uh, uh, editor, um, our wonderful friend and uh, great, great publisher, uh, uh, Greg Britton, just threw a link to it in the chat. Um, so please, please definitely grab a copy of this book. It's incredibly lucid. It feels like one synthetic voice, by the way. Um, it's uh, you guys really succeeded in that. Um, That's great. Well, um, let, let me let me ask you a, a, just a couple of starting questions about this. Uh, in fact, here let me uh, let me play with the video a little bit so that we can all uh, you know be face to face. Um, the uh, one of the challenges you put to us is that a lot of the metrics that we currently use are are badly badly flawed. Uh, and you look at return on investment numbers, you look at university rankings, institutional selectivity, uh, the actual price versus the actual payment. Uh, what happens with student debt, and then especially wages connected to uh, college majors. And you break these down and you have great criticisms where you say that the, uh, the data underlying these is often flawed and the analyses are as bad as preposterous. Um, and, uh, and most of your book is tearing these down, which is brilliant, and then building up what you think are alternatives. So I'm, I'm just curious if you could break down what are, what are some of the problems with these well-known and widely used stats? Sure. Yeah, so, uh, and there's a lot of examples in the book. Maybe I'll just choose one of sort of popularly known university rankings as sort of, a, I think, an example of the kind of thing we're trying to do in this book. You know, rankings are designed to take in all sorts of different information about universities and then produce a sausage that is helpful to students. But I think is often really unclear in these rankings is exactly who the consumer is supposed to be of rankings. After all, a lot of different people have very different interests in what to get out of a university, both on the student side, but then also as you think about graduate students and professors and university administrators and all 
of the various parties who have an interest in comparing and contrasting different schools. Our focus was on students. We were just trying to think through how should students decide if they have a choice between two different universities where they want to spend their late teens and early 20s. Uh, yeah. And the, the, where the chapter begins is just trying to look at research that has examined what happens when two students who are observably similar choose two universities, one of which is like slightly higher ranked than the other. And there have been now a number of research studies trying to study outcomes for these students that essentially see no difference in outcomes between these students in terms of educational attainment at the undergraduate or graduate level or uh, wages earned in the labor market, as well as a number of other potential non-economic outcomes for these students. So the place to start is to notice that despite the fact that rankings really highlight small differences between schools, the 15th ranked school seems very different from the 20th ranked school. Uh -huh. They're really hiding tremendous similarity in student outcomes across these institutions. Uh -huh. That being said, there are differences in student outcomes across institutions. So uh, the book highlights a really, I think, interesting study by Josh Goodman and Sarah Cahody is looking at a scholarship program called the Adams Scholarship in Massachusetts uh -huh. that in tendency pulled uh, students uh, by virtue of financial aid into relatively less selective universities. It tended to pull kids into, okay. into lower, uh, less selective public universities and away from more selective and, for what it's worth, higher ranked private universities. And you did see pretty substantial educational differences between these students getting pulled into a relatively lower graduation rate institution led these students themselves to become less likely to earn college degrees within four or six years. And so what the chapter develops is this idea that if, you're, if all your goal is to like figure out what's a good index for longer run educational and labor market outcomes on the basis of going from one university to another, it turns out you don't really need this sausage of rankings, this tremendous amount of information being pulled in from various uh, uh, sources and for various purposes, nor do you need tremendous uh, you know, other information about schools. It turns out just the, the university's graduation rate does a really good job of indexing what happens to students themselves when they get pulled between universities. And as a result, is a much more helpful metric for students to focus on as they're trying to decide between two different universities, just focusing on what is the four or six year graduation rate of the two schools. Now, in a lot of cases, the you know, graduation rate differences between schools that are very similarly ranked are basically identical. So if you look at top private universities, it, these all have graduation rates over 90%, extremely high rates. There is no fundamental difference in outcomes between these institutions, and the graduation rate reflects that. But if instead you look at differences between, say, in the, in the California context, between local comprehensive public universities like the CSU system and more selective universities like the, you know, the University of California campuses at San Diego mm -hmm. or Davis or Irvine, it really does look like student outcomes differ very substantially and causally at these different schools. And that's reflected in graduation rates, where a school like UC Irvine has a 50% graduation rate, and the average of the CSU campuses has about a 50% graduation rate. So the, the, these differences are, are, are substantial, and whenever those differences exist, it's worth students paying attention to them. We don't want to obfuscate the fact that there are differences in student outcomes across schools, but there's no reason to highlight small differences like is done by university rankings. That's a huge, well, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the U.S. News World Report rankings are so, so powerful. I mean, so many academics disdain them, but we live and die by them. And yet what you've isolated is a far simpler, far clearer, much more accessible uh, measurement that you could just pull out easily for any institution. And I want to emphasize there's now a long series of, I think, very high quality studies in economics looking at quasi experiments, cases where there's effective randomization of whether a student hmm. goes to one or another school. And these quasi experiments have now repeatedly demonstrated that graduation rates seem to do a really good job of indexing both education, educational and labor market gains to higher graduation rate institutions. Oh, this is fascinating. I mean, this is fascinating. And it's, it's kind of an uh, uh, almost a David and Goliath comparison to think about the huge apparatus that goes into US, US General the World Report. And you're just pulling out one thread, and that's the one that shines the brightest. Uh, can you? Can, let me let me ask you for one more of these of these numbers, which is uh, 
about tuition sticker price. And we, we've talked about this trend on the forum before for quite a long time, that the pricing for higher education is very non-transparent, that we have a published sticker price, uh, and that's what gets all the media attention. That's what everybody focuses on. And yet, um, tuition discounts are so steep now, uh, up to 50% plus at many institutions, depending on institution and the type, that, that what students actually pay is often lower. Um, where do how should we handle this? How should we be thinking about that uh, that price um, uh, metric? Sure. So again, the sort of structure of all of these chapters is very similar. We begin by just describing the metric that is presently very widely available. So if you just you know Google right now, I don't know Columbia University tuition, a number will come up. I think it's getting close to eighty thousand dollars a year between room board and tuition, and that number scares off a lot of families who either believe that uh, you know, various universities are more expensive than others on the basis of their sticker price, or choose uh, potentially not to apply to universities as all, at all as a result of the potentially high cost of enrolling at those schools. So we begin by just defining what this metric is. And then, as you said, you know, we point out that the large majority of students enrolling at these universities pay substantially less than the posted tuition price. Yep. That we do have a growing body of evidence that sticker prices scare a lot of kids off, especially from high cost yeah. institutions. But just the fact that there exist high cost institutions seem to scare kids off even from lower cost schools. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, this is the number that's widely apparent. And so you know, we make a number of recommendations in the chapter of what parents and students can try to look for to get a better sense of what college would actually cost to them. And uh, one recent example, I think, uh, has been the My Intuition uh, net price calculator. So lots of universities have net price calculators on their universities. I think they can be very difficult to manipulate and use. In a lot of cases, students don't have a lot of their parents' financial information that's required to complete these calculators. Simpler calculators like My Intuition, which is a, a project by Phil Levine, uh, an economist mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. university and is now available at over 70 college and universities in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, it, much simpler version of this. I think there's only six uh, questions that students have to answer before wow. being provided a range of tuitions that, uh, that they could be expected to pay at these different institutions. This is a much more helpful piece of information to students. There are other examples. Tuition Fit uh, is one, and I, I think other universities use other tools. But the idea is just to try to find higher quality information that is more decision relevant as students are making choices about where and whether to go. Well, thank you. That's a that's a clear and, and, and exciting answer. And by the way, friends, you may have seen a kind of black flicker here. Then this is one of our cats. This is Hunter. The uh, he has decided to join us in order to, uh, you know, this is this is the way things go. The cats want to show off. Uh, let me let me uh, follow Hunter and step back a little bit and ask um, for all of your questions. Uh, and we already have some. And if you haven't read the book, that's a, quite all right. I mean. You have your assignment ahead of you, uh, but um, but please respond to uh, what uh, Zach has been talking about, and also ask your questions about the overall topic of metrics. Uh, the first one I want to bring up is uh, Lynn Sibolsky. I'll bring up a video question from her. Let's see if, if uh, she's oh there you are. Hello, Lynn. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Always a win. <laughs> um, Zachary, thank you for coming on today. For context, I'm a college financial aid nerd. Um, that's my career and that's also my area of kind of advocacy and, and trying to improve the industry. Right. One thing that I am working on with my colleagues is the idea that the financial aid office doesn't always have the correct information. Um, for example, there are lots of resources that say, hey, if you want information on scholarships and outside scholarships, contact your financial aid office. Within higher education institutions, as I'm sure you're aware, there are different methods of distributing scholarships, especially the outside scholarships. And in some cases, a student is saying, hey, I'm doing the math, I should get some money back. And the school says, oh, hey, now that you've won some outside scholarships, I'm gonna take away your merit scholarships and give it to someone else. Can you please speak to scholarships in general in terms of student outcomes and how invested schools and private companies should be in giving out scholarships. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So uh, you know, tuition discounts and the, the obfuscation around tuition discounts make it really difficult for kids to make informed decisions about whether to go to school and where to go to school. But I, I think uh, some, some recent research by Sue Donarski and others 
has really shined a light on the best ways that schools can use scholarship programs to encourage either more kids to attend college uh, or to, uh, to promote outcomes for those students. So uh, th th this recent study, I think it came out last year in the American Economic Review, and uh, we discuss it at some length in the book, focuses on the Hale Scholarship at the University of Michigan, which was sort of an interesting policy. The Hale Scholarship actually didn't have any money associated with it. Uh, the way it worked is that the University of Michigan went out of its way to, to identify students in the beginning of their senior years who they believed on the basis of uh, uh, FAFSA information and other family income information would be eligible for a full scholarship if they applied to the University of Michigan and were admitted and then we went through the full financial aid process. And, uh, and so they, they informed those students directly, congratulations, you've been given a Hale scholarship. That means if you get into the University of Michigan, we're going to guarantee that you are going to attend the University of Michigan tuition free. What they saw was a large increase in the number of these kids who just sent an application to the University of Michigan in the first place. A big number of them got in and many of them attended the University of Michigan. But again, like I said, it didn't net cost the University of Michigan any additional funds. They, were, they would have already guaranteed those funds to these students because they were already eligible for financial aid under the University of Michigan's traditional financial aid policy. This, what this did was provide information to students earlier where they were actually making important choices about whether and where to, uh, to attend college, uh, or at least to apply to college. And just providing this information a little bit earlier was extremely impactful on whether these kids enrolled at any college at all, and in particular, if they attended the University of Michigan. Now, you can see that I've kind of twisted your question here. Really, what you were asking about was these different agencies inside of the institution. And where I'm trying to push the question is thinking about how these agencies can better be used to serve student interests. And I, I think the Hale Scholarship gave just one nice example of this. While bureaucratic challenges make it, I think, really difficult either to move money around or to, to make as transparent as possible to students what it would cost for them to enroll at universities, these kinds of relatively simple policies that just provide more information when it's being used by students can be really meaningful for, for long run outcomes of those students. Wow, thank you. <laughs> well, sorry to only partially answer the question, but but at least you know, as we're thinking about sort of the student oriented version of this, I, I think that's that's one way in which these scholarships can be really impactful. Well, Lynn, thank you for the great question. And please keep being a financial aid nerd. We need more of you. Uh, and thank you so much, Zach, for that for that terrific uh, and self-aware answer. Uh, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, this is an example of a text of a video question. Excuse me. So you can just join us and you can tell we're, we're very welcoming. Um, and I even host people who don't have beards. Um, so uh, now let me uh, let me bring up some of the text questions uh, that have come up. Uh, and this is one from uh, our dear friend, Roxanne Riskin. Uh, and she asks this. Um, when is the most sensitive time, age, or grade for high school students and parents to read your book? And do you know if high schools have easy access to this critical information? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great question. So the book is very much targeted toward students in their junior and senior years and parents of students in their junior and senior years. Uh, you know, the first chapter of the book is about return on investment indicators, uh, which are the kinds of metrics that students who are just deciding whether to go to college in the first place might look at as they're weighing the, you know, the relative returns in, in an economic sense of going to college versus entering the labor market directly, just getting a job straight out of high school. So the first chapter is very much targeted toward that kind of student. Mm. And then the book sort of proceeds from that point. So the last couple of chapters of the book are about college major choice. So we have a chapter about average wages by college major, helping kids choose mm -hmm. between majors that have uh, higher or lower pay, and then college mobility rankings and thinking about you know, the kids' access to college majors and the degree to which universities can provide uh, 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 mobility to relatively lower income students. So uh, I, I think there's, I, I don't, I think the earliest age that we're sort of targeting the book to is people who are just starting to think about the college process. Younger kids, I guess, to the degree that they have to start investing in the kinds of materials that are used by colleges for admission, uh, by colleges for admission, uh, at least might find some of this information helpful. But I really think it's juniors and seniors who will find it most relevant. To the degree that, you know, to this question of whether kids have access to this information, you know, the best I think that we're able to do is you know, sort of send this book out into the world, uh, raise publicity to try to help kids get uh, uh, this information. I think it really calls attention to the academic work that's being summarized in this book. So, right, so 
fundamentally, this book is not doing any you know, tremendously new work. What it's doing is translating a lot of work by you know, many of my colleagues and others who have done relatively technical work on the relationship between educational choices and long run outcomes of students that is wholly inaccessible to the public. And the book is an attempt to make this information more accessible. Uh, I, I think the, the sort of the variety of authors and, and backgrounds that we brought to the book hopefully did a, a helpful job in sort of translating this work to the public. But uh, and so, you know, we're sort of now in the process of making sure the public has access to this information as best they can. Well, and uh, we're happy to do our part to uh, spread the word. Um, Roxanne is just down the road from you, by the way. She's in Connecticut as well. Uh, and Roxanne, thank you for the really, really good question. So that's an example of a text question. So again, just go look at the bottom of the screen where that white band is and go to the question mark if you want to type in a, a text question like Roxanne's or click the raised hand if you want to beam on stage like Lynn. Um, we have questions already in the pipeline, Zach, so I want to make sure they get a chance. Uh, our dear friend and fellow author Tom Hames uh, asks a, one, one of his typically deep questions. Uh, and this is, do our metrics measure content over skills? when skills are really the determining factor in success post-college? So I think there are a couple of different ways of taking this question, but I, I think the, the sort of the dominant thread that I'm seeing in here is just wondering about how universities choose which students to admit into a university. So typically this, this sort of distinction between content and skill, I think is made in the context of like, you know, thinking about standardized tests and grades as being two different kinds of information that are used by uh, universities in making admissions decisions. And I think the, the, as a result, the sort of relevant answer to that question depends on the objective of a university. So in the case of private universities that uh, might have a variety of objectives, but I think largely uh, come down to that they're looking to produce alumni who are very successful in society. I agree, you know, there's some sense in which just identifying the kids who, you know, w whether or not they, uh, uh, they learned uh, uh, a lot in high school, or like the kids who just you know, uh, have, have tremendous capabilities, maybe as shown uh, on a standardized test, might be the right kids to admit uh, in that context, because these are kids who, you know, long after graduating high school, uh, might be able to take advantage of those capabilities uh, in the labor market, whether or not they went to that university. At public universities, I think that the context is a lot less clear. So you know, yeah. it's, I think it's not really clear exactly what the objective of a public university should be in admission. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, you know, as then students are making this choice between public and private university, then sort of the same question arises of like, what is the student's objective in these different contexts? To the degree that public universities are intended to identify the kids who will most benefit from their enrollment, I, I think we now have growing evidence to suggest that standardized tests and these sort of measures of skill do a very poor job of identifying these like potentially high value add students. Mm. Uh, whereas measures of content like grades do at least a somewhat better job, though still imperfect in identifying uh, which students would really succeed at public universities. I, uh, sorry if I twisted your question in a different direction than you intended it, but, uh, but at least yeah. I, think, I think that's what's most relevant here. Well, it's a fascinating question, and it's it's a very, very rich answer, Zach. Um, and Tom, if, if you want to follow up, just click the raised hand, um, and we'd be glad to beam you on stage. Um, we have more questions, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to uh, uh, to ask. Uh, our friend Glenn McGee, uh, who is always, always has a laser-like look at the data, um, and Glenn asks this interesting question, because this hasn't come up in our conversation so far. Uh, metrics that matter needs to include underemployment or malemployment which ends currently at 43%. Can this be a proxy for credential inflation? Yeah, I, so I think this is a super interesting question. There are a lot of people who hold college degrees uh, who nevertheless work in jobs that don't require a college degree. From an economic perspective, there's a certain uh, uh, notion by which you know, th this is somewhat concerning, right? You know, there's a sense in which people aren't taking advantage of the college degree that they hold. Though I think in many cases, that's often not clear. So even within narrow um, uh, occupational groups, it nevertheless remains the case that wages for college graduates are higher than wages for non-college graduates. This indicates that the college degree is still providing productivity enhancement, that, that people are still providing added value in the workplace on the basis of their college degree that ne isn't necessarily just captured by their occupational title. But I, that, you know, that piece aside, I think it also calls into account 
you know, just questions of exactly how long run economic outcomes for different kinds of uh, educational attainment are constructed. So to give one example, you know, if, if you think about like the average wages in different college majors, you know, how do we calculate those average wages? Well, we only look at the people who hold jobs and then we take average wages among the employed. Now that's including both the you know, so-called overemployed and underemployed, sort of everyone gets thrown into the same bucket. But notice that one thing it doesn't include, it doesn't include is the unemployed, right? So, so one thing that's happening when you look at average wage by major statistics is you're, you're not paying attention to the fact that whether or not some majors might lead to relatively high wages, that doesn't necessarily mean they lead to employment at all or employment in the first place. If you look at unemployment rates, they differ pretty widely by college major. Uh, sort of interestingly, currently the highest unemployment rate major in the U.S. is linguistics. Um, and, and so as a result, you know, as you're thinking through, like, what is the relative economic value of a linguistics major? Now, I, I really don't mean to emphasize that uh, the only value of a linguistics major is economic, but to the degree that you're sort of interested in the economic value of linguistics, you might want to sort of temper uh, your, your, your expectations just on the basis of average wage statistics. Because while they do account for these measures like uh, or these employments like underemployment, they're not accounting for unemployment altogether. So in this chapter on average wages by major, we go through a number of examples like this of sort of challenges in just the direct computation of the economic value of relative uh, of different college majors. Again, not just you know not, not stating that this is the only value of majors, but to the degree that students are interested in this, these are things that probably they should be taking into account. Uh, that's interesting. That's a very, very different way of thinking about this. Uh, uh, by the way, Glenn, first of all, thank you for, for bringing this up, um, and we really appreciate this. And also, Glenn just shared, uh, here, I'll share this twice, uh, a fascinating tool. This is from uh, the uh, Census Department taking a look at uh, links between STEM uh, degrees and what people actually study. And I'll, I'll just copy and paste this in the chat, too, because uh, it's, it's an elegant visualization and a, and a fascinating one. Um, I haven't been to this website, but I suspect what it shows is that you'll see that people who earn degrees very rarely work in the, the sort of most natural industry associated with that degree. So to yeah. give an example from my own field, no more than 20% of people with economics degrees are working in industries that have really anything to do with economics training. Huh. It doesn't mean that these degrees aren't providing value. It's just that you, you know, they're providing value in right. a lot of areas you might not expect them to. Well, there's, there's a limit to the signaling function of, of, of the degree in terms of its content. Uh, we also have another question from uh, President George uh, Pornsteiner, uh, or Pornsteiner, who um, has had a, a fantastic career. And he asked a very, very direct and powerful question. How could your findings inform state or university policies? Yeah, so uh, I, I think there are a number of cases where this can be helpful. So uh, again, I'm just going to take um, one example in particular. Uh, so the final chapter of the book thinks about mobility rankings between dif different universities. So uh, right. I think what people might be most aware of in this context are uh, numbers that have been put out by Opportunity Insights, Raj Chetty's group, through their mobility report cards, which indicate which schools uh, have the highest share of low-income students uh, that end up succeeding later in life. So one thing the book uh, discusses in this final chapter on these mobility rankings is that the mobility rankings don't necessarily conform to the schools where lower income students would be best off. And in fact, I, I think it's often not the case that lower income students would be best off going to these low or uh, these high mobility institutions. So uh, for context, the, high, the highest mobility institutions in the U.S. tend to be in the California State University system and in the CUNY Ooh, system in New right, York. Right. These are schools that do enroll very large numbers of low income students. And their graduates have surprising success given the, the, the high schools and uh, family backgrounds that their students are coming from. But the, the reason that they're indicated here as being called high mobility is not that their causal effect on low income kids is, is supremely positive, but it's instead because they enroll a very large number of low income kids. The more low income kids you enroll, the, the greater degree to which you are considered a high mobility institution. As a result, low-income kids who are making choices between institutions should not be looking at mobility rankings. It's actually not relevant information to low-income kids as they're trying to decide which schools will most benefit them in terms of educational and labor market gains. As I mentioned earlier, an indicator like the graduation rate 
is a much better indicator for low-income students to try to determine which school sh uh, that they should be uh, uh, choosing. However, on the side of policymakers, these mobility rankings are extremely helpful. These mobility rankings are indicating which schools could be most benefited by uh, federal and state dollars to promote the lower income students enrolling at those schools. So these are schools that have uh, student bodies who are likely extremely uh, susceptible and amenable to additional funding. They tend to be substantially underfunded schools. And I, so I think these mobility rankings, while sort of you know, presented publicly as if useful to students, are in fact primarily and maybe solely valuable to policymakers as they're making funding and allocation decisions about where to, to you know, provide greater support to university administration and to student bodies. Well, George, thank you for that great question. Uh, and, and Zach, you just gave a terrific outline of, of, of what could be done with this. Uh, in the chat, Glenn McGee builds on this and asks, uh, quote, any thoughts on how more complete data can be inputted into the policy space? What would happen then after including for things like underemployment, effects of credential inflation? Yeah, so again, just to choose you know, one particular example, going back to uh, average wages by college major. Uh, so you know, you know, take two um, majors at a given university, say um, you know, geology and history. And you, know, you, you can now go and you know, look up in the college scorecard, the average wages of people who earn one or another of these majors. Uh, you know, they, they present these wages three years after graduating, which is very short. A lot of these kids might still be in graduate school or haven't yet uh, you know, properly fallen into their long run career trajectory. But this provides a little bit of information. And uh, what you would see is that on average, geology majors earn somewhat more than history majors uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their early careers and uh, persistently throughout their lives. And so you can imagine, uh, on the one hand, students looking at this information and making choices, you know, you know, I wanted to be a history major, but now I see that geology majors earn more money. I think that that could open doors for me later in life. And so I, I wouldn't want to say no to this opportunity. And you can imagine policymakers looking at this and say, oh, like we should do our best to expand these majors, you know, make, you know, make as many seats available, maybe encourage students into these more lucrative fields of study because it might be in their best interest financially to choose these more lucrative college majors. Yeah. So I think it's a sort of a, a plausible thing for people to believe on either side. And uh, what it, it, but it turns out that it, I think that's, that can be very misleading to students. And so mm -hmm. I just want to sort of talk you through, I think a really fascinating, the most fascinating study that I'm aware of uh, in terms of the, the long run outcomes of choosing one or another college major for students. And this is a study that was conducted by Magda Mogstad, who was a, an economist at uh, the University of Chicago. It was published in 2016. And it, it focuses on this sort of interesting setting in the country of Norway, where Magna is from. Uh, and so, so Magna and his co-authors noticed that Norway has this application system into universities, where instead of applying directly to universities, what kids do is they send into the federal government a rank order list of their most preferred university major pairs. So you say, OK, you know, my first choice is I want to be a computer science major at the University of Oslo. And if I can't get into the computer science major at the University of Oslo, then my second choice is to be a history major at Bergen. And my third choice is to be a computer science major at Bergen, et cetera. Kids send in these rank order preferences. And then there's a centralized admission scheme. Kids are admitted into the most preferred of their programs that still has a slot available for people of their uh, high school GPA and test score. So the better you do in high school, the more access you have. And so you know, the top programs get allocated to the top students. And then sort of all the way down, kids get into the best program that they would be able to get into, but they're only admitted to a single program. So Magna and his co-authors look at this and say, here's a really cool opportunity to study what happens when, say, there's a kid who really wants to go into, say, geology, but there's no slots available for students with their high school grades in geology. So they get bumped down to their second choice, say, history major instead. And then there's also a different kind of student, a student who really wanted to get into their most preferred history major, but that's not available to them. Those slots were already taken up for kids of their type. And so they got pushed into geology instead. And what this study shows, it follows both of these uh, pairs of students for the subsequent 10 years. 
And so follows them into the labor market, looks at how much money they're making in the Norwegian labor market, yeah. and shows that in both cases, these students are, are losers in terms of long-run labor market outcomes if they get their second choice relative to their first choice. Now, one of those isn't surprising. Getting bumped from geology to history, I think it would surprise no one to learn that that kid ends up earning less money later in life. After all, they're not earning one of these lucrative STEM majors. But the other is more surprising. The kid who get, gets bumped from history into geology, you might have thought would get a wage advantage, but that's not what happens. Actually, they end up with relatively lower wages in their late 20s than they would have had if they'd had access to the history major, their first choice major. The authors take this as evidence of what they call comparative advantage, but what we can just think of as a relative lucrativeness or, or a financial advantage in studying what you most prefer to study. It looks like, at least in cases where the relative returns to different, universe, uh, different majors are relatively small, having, you know, just having access to your most preferred major, being able to study what you want, confers with it long-run labor market benefits, even if the average wages in that major are somewhat mm. lower than your, your sort of fallback major. Well, that's now, fascinating. The, the reason I think to pay attention to this is that this is a reason for policymakers to not try to push kids into STEM fields and away from fields that have somewhat similar but lower wages. That would be a missed opportunity for kids to take advantage of their most preferred field. Which would lead to a better life outcome overall. That That's fascinating. That's a fascinating study. Um, thank you. Thank you for drawing attention to that and summarizing that and, uh, and for using that in the book. Uh, friends, we only have about 13 minutes left, and uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask their question. So again, on the bottom of the screen, just click the raised hand if you want to be up here on stage uh, with, uh, with Zach and I. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of books in the background. You can still join us. Um, or just uh, type the, uh, the question mark, hit that, and you can type in your question in the chat box there. Um, while people are thinking about this, uh, I, I had a question specifically about the uh, student debt chapter, uh, which is interesting because that's a metric which is which is outstanding. I mean, that's a you know the total amount of debt is huge, and there's a lot of discussion about different types. Um, and and in your conclusion, I, I'm not sure if I followed it. I mean, your conclusion seemed to be that there's lots of different kinds of debt. Some of the debt pays off pretty well, and that it's a there didn't seem to be a good replacement metric for us to pay attention to. Um, yeah. What, what am I missing or what, what did you conclude on that? No, so I think that's exactly right. I think our struggle with student debt metrics is that fundamentally what was being reflected in student debt metrics had very little to do with actual financial decisions making, you know, being, uh, uh, being uh, provided to students. Instead, fundamentally, the decision that students were making was about tuition. And debt was one of the many ways that they could choose to pay that tuition. And so what we sort of end up concluding in our chapter on debt is that rather than paying much attention to say, average debt loads coming out of different institutions or overall average debt in the US economy, these are choices that kids and families have to make. They're, they're choices that are primarily being made even before kids choose where to go to college. Once they finally have financial aid information from institutions, and are able to make informed choices about the relative costs and benefits of different schools. You know, we don't think that these metrics on debt are sort of adding additional information over and above what kids can learn about the actual costs of different schools. And so I agree, you know, this is the one chapter where we're not clearly pointing students in some other direction. In fact, this is information that we just don't think is very helpful to students. And instead they should be paying attention just directly to the relative costs of going to one or another school or studying one or another field. Oh, interesting. So this is a metric that is kind of, uh, that kind of blots out other more useful metrics, e even though it is accurate in what it describes at a macro level, it, it's not going to be very helpful at the micro individual level. Yeah, that's exactly, and actually, and actually that, that really calls something out very important. So again, from the perspective of policymakers who are thinking about how university education is financed in the US, these debt metrics are extremely helpful. So. You know, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York publishes quarterly statistics on just aggregate debt in the U.S. economy yeah. and it provides a lot of information about what kinds of kids hold that debt, what schools are generating that debt, where in the U.S. the debt sits. These are uh, really important pieces of information for policymakers who are thinking through changes in state funding of higher education, changes in the allocation of financial aid, et cetera. But they aren't very helpful pieces of information for students who are choosing whether and where to go to college. That's fascinating. Because that's something that I know I pay a great deal of attention to. But uh, if we go back to Roxanne's question on the question of in, an individual student, 
um, then we can have much more actionable, much more uh, relevant data. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Zach. That's a really good answer. Um, thank you. That clarifies a lot. Uh, we have a question from uh, Shelby Rosengarten uh, at St. Petersburg College in Florida. And as usual, for everyone from Florida, we send our best wishes uh, for your survival uh, during this time. And Shelby asks the question, though, how does this apply to community colleges? Was that part of your study? Yes, it was. Many community college graduates successfully transfer out and don't carry the same weight of debt. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a fantastic question. And I think really highlights the value of metrics like for your graduation rate, though it should be emphasized that it can be somewhat difficult to get graduation rate measures for community colleges. So, uh, so one thing we do in the book is, right, so we, you know, as we're talking about the, you know, the kinds of institutions where kids can enroll and long run outcomes of enrolling at these different institutions, community colleges are very much part of that story. They are substantially lower cost on average and they're open access, so students would in any case be able to attend these schools. But if you were to say, you know, try to measure a six-year graduation rate for a community college. So what do I mean by that? I mean, taking the kids who enroll at this community college coming out of high school, and maybe not including anyone who just intends to, uh, to you know, say, go to community college for a year and then into the labor market, or people who have already been in the labor market for some years and come back to community college. Uh, before you know just to get some uh, professional training before returning instead just fo focusing on the kids who come straight in from high school and then you can just ask the question okay what share of those kids have earned a, a college degree within six years from any four-year institution in the u.s or if it's a community college that offers BAs, which is now growing in popularity in some states uh -huh. have kids who show up at this community college earned a, a ba from either the community college or somewhere else transfer you yeah. see is that there's a wide range in the success of community college students in eventually attaining four-year degrees, which it should be emphasized are of far greater economic value than just the associate's degree that most community colleges offer. Right. Though it should nevertheless be emphasized that associate's degrees confer economic returns that mm -hmm. not going to college at all uh, do not. What you would see, so uh, you know, we've, we've measured these six-year graduation rates for most of the California community colleges. And there's a range in community colleges from something like 10 to 50 percent, uh, which is to say 10 to 50 percent of kids uh, coming into the community college straight from high school have earned a college degree somewhere within six years of enrolling at this community college. Now, for those community colleges at a 50 percent level, that's actually not so different from many of the sort of, of the less selective or relatively yeah. open yeah. or access public yeah. uni four-year universities in the U.S., and in particular in California. In fact, it's substantially higher than six-year graduation rates at many of the non-selective four-year public universities in the U.S. Sure. That being said, it's substantially lower than the graduation rate of what you might think of as like the relatively more selective uh, public universities, certainly uh, uh, almost the entire set of public research universities. And so I, I think the takeaway here is on the one hand, community college does save money, that's important, but to the degree that students have access to relatively higher graduation rate institutions in the four-year sector, that's probably worth it in terms of at least long-run economic outcomes for students and in terms of likelihood of actually attaining a college degree relative to just going to the community college. Well, that's, and that covers so much ground and, and that brings up the whole question of transfer rates and, and, and credit you know, mobility and, and all of this. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so Shelby, thank you for bringing up community colleges and, and thank you, Zach, for uh, such an incredibly powerful answer. Uh, we have one more question and we'll go back to uh, Lynn Sobolski who asks a, a text question here. And Lynn asks, for both of us, Zach and Brian, how much value do the higher ups policymakers at higher education's place on uh, the research finding in your work? Is it hard to get their attention or do they actively seek out your expertise? Well, Zach, you go first, you go first. Sure. So I, I'll give two answers to this question, maybe one more promising than the other. So I'll start with a less promising example. I mentioned toward the beginning of this conversation, this study in the Massachusetts setting in which uh, uh, for about 15 years, the Massachusetts state legislature has provided the Adams Scholarship to the top 25% of kids coming out of each Massachusetts high school. Uh, the Adams Scholarship guarantees full tuition uh, cost at all public universities in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, so th this, I, I think, really excellent paper by, by Josh Goodman and Sarah Cahodes a couple of years ago showed 
that the net effect of the Adams scholarship is actually to decrease students' likelihood of earning a college degree within six years. Whoa. Why is that? Because the, the public Massachusetts university system, right. in, in, especially compared to many other states' public university systems, but especially compared to the private university system in the state of Massachusetts, mm. is not doing a very good job of graduating many of its students. They have relatively low graduation rates. And so the net effect of the Adams scholarship is actually to encourage in-state students into relatively lower graduation rate public institutions where they are less likely to earn a college degree than the otherwise than the schools, primarily private schools, where these students would have otherwise enrolled. This is uh, frustrating, that, uh, but uh, to this question about policymaking, uh, the paper was published in 2014. It's now almost 10 years later, and the Massachusetts uh, government still provides Adams scholarships to students. So uh, it was, we still believe that the net effect of the Adams scholarship is to decrease graduation rates, but this has not stopped policymakers from awarding these scholarships. I think you know, to give a sort of one second example, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I've been doing a lot of work recently about race-based affirmative action. I put out a, a, a number of papers on the subject over mm -hmm. the last couple of years. And because uh, of the expected Supreme Court decision in June will lead many public and private universities to have to change their undergraduate admissions policies, I've now been receiving you know, a lot of calls from uh, admissions offices and other university administrators sort of hunting for alternatives. And I, I think it's been a space where actually, because universities have so little experience thinking about what it would mean to conduct race neutral admissions policies, this has been a place where my sense is that academics have been very influential in shaping how uh, selective public and private universities can share policies uh, that uh, have been implemented in the nine states that have already banned race-based affirmative action and can try to get a better sense of just what's available to them and how they can move forward as a result of these likely radical changes in how they admit students. I'm well. Thank you for that answer, Zach. I, I'm just that that Adam's story just depresses me. I, I haven't heard that, and that's so. Oh God, oh, that's that's so sad. Um, the uh, to, to answer your question very very quickly, uh, Lynn, because I'm here in like facilitator role rather than presenter role. Um, uh, I get. Uh, I'll, demand for my services. I, I uh, get uh, flown out or videoed in to talk to trustees, to some state governments, some national governments, um, and people buy my books and uh, and people watch videos like this. So I have some influence um, and, and share my research. Uh, I would like to have more. And I'd like to sharpen my research, but uh, there's some traction. Uh, on the other hand, um, well, I'll, I'll hold back from saying more because uh, I don't want to get too far off topic, but thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I'm, I, as the host, though, I do want to assert uh, one bit of privilege, which is to ask a, a final question. Um, and Zach, if, if you could wave the proverbial magic wand and, and get everybody in higher education and everyone paying attention to higher education to switch the metrics um, you know, from the, from the preposterous and ill-suited data that you described and, and criticized to the alternatives that you talk about instead, what would, if that happened, and then you were to press fast forward on the on the video, and it's ten years later. What what changes would that make in college and university life? Great. So I, I think as as we were putting this book together, thinking about how we should make these recommendations, we had two uh, goals in mind, and I, I think it's these same two goals that would would occur in the scenario that you imagined. So if people uh, on the student side, students and parents, were to pay more attention to the information that we're making suggestions about uh, and less attention to uh, the many kinds of metrics uh, that kids are, are, are primarily paying attention to. Uh, so what this would do is allow students to make more informed decisions about whether and where to go to college and what to study. So what would the net effect of that be? Well, given that on average, informational uh, quality among students and parents is substantially lower among lower income and otherwise disadvantaged high school students, I think what you would see is a net inflow of lower income and otherwise disadvantaged students into both less and more selective universities. So there's both an inflow into the higher education system altogether, because I think these metrics would indicate uh, to those students the very substantial value of holding a college degree in the US in the 21st century, but also would, uh, would uh, push lower income students toward what are actually higher quality institutions for those students, schools that are able to uh, educate those students, get them degrees, 
and then lead them to uh, successful or, or re relatively more successful lives. So I think it would sort of help reorient the informational sector among parents and students that would primarily benefit uh, uh, people who have relatively poor information about the higher education system. I'll very quickly say in the last 30 seconds here that I think it would also help reorient university priorities away from, you know, the, the book is filled with these anecdotes of like dumb ways that universities use to either increase their rankings or make them look more prestigious or put or, or, or lead kids to make really problematic decisions um, about uh, you know, what they want to study and how they want to spend their years in college. I think the metrics that we've chosen are in a sense incentive compatible. If you were to incentivize k k uh, schools along these metrics, I think this would improve the quality of education that these schools are providing to their students. Wow. Well, that's that's a magic wand we need to get waving, I think. Um, and uh, I, I hope in this past hour of very energetic and genial conversation, I hope we've waved that wand a little bit further. Um, Zach, we are unfortunately out of time, and I appreciate your your eye on the clock. What's the best way to keep up with you and your work? Uh, do you have a sure. newsletter? Or should we just email you out of the blue, or uh, are you active in social media? How do we how do we keep up with the next step in the lean reverse? Yeah, so you'll see. So you know, all five of the authors on this book uh, have public profiles. It's easy to find me on my website. Uh, I don't have a regular newsletter, though I, I'm publishing a couple of papers a year, and they'll be posted to the website. But also, please feel free. It's just you know, first name, dot last name, Zachary Dublimer at Yale.edu. I'd be very happy to talk to any of you about any of these issues. Oh, well, fantastic. Well, good luck. Uh, first of all, on on all on, on this book in the world, I, I think I'm, I'm so honored that we had a chance to spend time talking with you. Uh, everybody, this is a book. I think it's it's very short. It's incredibly readable. Uh, it's just a, a, a primer, uh, I think, on, on how to proceed. Um, I, I just I hope that we all get a chance to, uh, to take a look at it. And uh, Zach, all best with your uh, research projects coming up. Um, thank you so much. so much. And, uh, don't, and enjoy the warm weather while you can. Cheers, and the same to you all. Thank you, Zach. Uh, thank you all, friends, for the great questions uh, for today. Um, thank you all for the, uh, for the thoughtful uh, ways of interrogating and thinking about metrics. Let's take a look quickly at what's coming up. Uh, we have a session coming up on ed tech and labor, and still more to come. You can find that on our website. Uh, if you want to keep talking about these measures, uh, is this the right way to think about uh, return on investment? Is this the right way to connect students with the right majors? Just use the hashtag FTTE and throw that at Twitter or at Mastodon or wherever we happen to be. If you want to go back and look at similar topics, including our previous two uh, appearances by Chris Newfield, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, and above all, thank you all for your time today. It is, as always, splendid thinking about the future of higher ed in your company. I hope you're all well. If you're in a spot getting spring, I hope spring springs with a great deal of delight. In the meantime, everybody, take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.